Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This week's portion is Tetzaveh. It means you shall command. It's Exodus 2720 through 3010. The Haftarah portion is 1 Samuel 15, 2 through 34. And the Apostolic Scripture portion is Revelation 21, 12 through 14. The introduction. The Torah now moves to establish the kahuna, the priesthood, through Aaron and his son. They are provided with special clothing and adornments to distinguish them from the other Israelites and to mark them for sacred service. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is unique in his attire. Exodus 28, 29-30 Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. You shall put in the breastpiece of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. So the Hebrew word for the breastplate is Hoshen, or Hoshen, and it means breastplate, breastpiece, sacred path to the high priest, designed to hold the Urim and the Thummim. So it's kind of interesting when you think about it. Now this precedes the sin of the golden calf. Not by much, but it precedes the sin of the golden calf. Where Aaron is set apart to Israel to be the first high priest of Israel. So then right after this, when this occurs, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai for the first time. And then we come to Exodus 32 starting in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears, ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Well, Aaron just gets appointed as high priest. He's not even set yet to take office. And here's the evidence stacked against him for what happens. And we also know his response to Moses. When Moses asked him what happened, his response to Moses was, it just jumped out of the fire. Okay? Yep. And the attitude of the people is even, you know, for them, the response, you know, they say, as for this Moses, it's like, who's Moses? Where is he? He's not here. You know? Uh, we don't know where he's at. So guess what, Aaron? You are the high priest. So now you make us a god. And the dumb dumb did it. He did what the people wanted. Because he wanted to please the people. So what did he care about? Did he care about the sanctity and the honor of God? Or was he afraid for himself? But at the same time, he not only fashions this golden calf, but when he sees it all done, and he hears what the people have to say, he builds an altar for it. But that's not even enough. He goes on and he says, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So now he's making his own feast day. He's doing exactly what the northern tribes would wind up doing. Making their own priesthood, making their own festivals, making their own gods in the same way that Aaron did here. I wonder if they followed Aaron's example when Aaron did this. But at the same time, when you go back and you read 
Exodus 28, 29, and 30, which we just did, it says that Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. I would have to believe that the Lord knew what Aaron was going to do. You can't hide anything from God. God would know what he was going to do. So here he's already making it a way that Aaron is going to have to carry this responsibility for what's going to happen because he was part of this. If he would have refused to do what they said, who knows, they came to him to do it. Were they going to do wipe him out and then go to the next in line who was ever there? I guess his sons would have been next. But we already know what two of his sons would have done. They probably would have done the same thing and made the calf and made the worship and they would have loved it because they took it upon themselves to go into the Holy of Holies. And we all know how that story turned out. It didn't turn out well. So, you know, it's always amazed me that God chose Aaron as the first high priest, but maybe he needed somebody who could connect to the people who would commit this sin and then have to spend the rest of his life repenting for what he had done. Coming in every single year before God into the Holy of Holies and having to intercede on behalf of the children of Israel every single year for the rest of his life. He would have to do this. But then he also had to go in and he had to mediate between God and man with the people and everything over the different sacrifices and the different things that had to be done that were in there. So he carried this responsibility. It was his responsibility. No one else could take this responsibility from him. There was only one high priest. And it wasn't Moses. Moses may have been of the tribe of Levi, but Moses was not of the line of Aaron. The line of Aaron was the line that was chosen to be the priest of Israel. The Levites were chosen to serve the Levites, I mean the Aaronic priests, and help them in the tabernacle and later in the temple. The interesting thing about it is, is that Moses would be the one who would be above Aaron who was the one who put Aaron into the place where he was and he would perform the ceremony, setting him and his sons apart, giving the instruction for how the uh, tabernacle was to be constructed, for how everything was to be made for the tabernacle, for how worship was to be done, for all of these different things. Moses was the one who would instruct each and every person who was responsible for helping in the construction of the tabernacle. So Moses basically would be in the position of being like Yeshua. He would be between God the Father and between the people of Israel. He would be the mediator between them. And then Aaron would step in and then he would become the mediator for the people also. And then Aaron, Moses would be that one step difference who would be the final judge and jury of Israel. Because remember what they had decided when Moses was judging all of Israel at that place and he listened to Jethro, his father-in-law's advice, about establishing a judge system and how that was to operate, that he was to be the final judge. If they couldn't decide what they were supposed to do, they were to come to Moses and he would make the final decision because he is the one who understood the commands that God had given to him and how they were supposed to be carried out by Israel. But this is kind of, this is the all-time low point for Israel. But it wouldn't be the only time that it would be the low point for all of Israel. Because Israel would go through their ups and downs throughout their lifetime throughout their generation, throughout all the years that they would be, they would go up, they would go down, they would go up, they would go down and do all these things. But you know, that's kind of a mirror for how we are in our walk. We go up, we go down. We go up, we go down. 
And then sometimes we find that little plateau that kind of makes us feel comfortable and we and we're feel that we've hit our groove there. And for those of us who have been doing this for a long time, we know it ain't going to last. It does not last. You know, something's going to come along. And we have to start looking at when these things come along as they're tests from God to see how we're going to respond. And a lot of times, we fail. Yeah, I know I fail quite a bit for that. And then I have to go back to God and I have to apologize to God for what I've done and, you know, for things I've said or things I've done and all that. You know, uh, telling people that that's just an Eastern attitude doesn't always work. So <laughs> sometimes it's just really you got to do what you got to do. So. Well, I buy it, Rabbi, and I understand. <laughs> I would say something, but I would get in trouble, and I don't want to do it now. 1 Samuel 15, 22-29. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of ram. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. This mirrors what we just read about in the Torah portion with what Israel had done. Now, it's the first king of Israel, Saul, who's doing the same thing. It's obvious he didn't do what was instructed in the Torah where he's supposed to make a copy of the Torah, keep it with him at all times, and meditate on it day and night. He was supposed to read it. He was supposed to learn from it because that was supposed to be how you rule Israel. You rule from the Torah. And that's apparently what Saul did not do. But Saul was also a king that God did not choose. The people did. The people asked for a king like the nations had. And God gave them a king just like the nations did. He gave them Saul. And Samuel in the response and seeing what Saul had done and he says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. For rebellion is the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. So, burnt offerings and sacrifices are not as important to God as obedience as doing what he tells you to do. Why? Why should we listen and obey God? Because he is God. Amen. And everything that exists, he created. If you don't believe that, then you don't believe the word of God. Because the word of God is very straightforward in the fact that it tells us that in the beginning, God created. He created everything that exists, particularly us. Mankind came about because God desired to have a relationship with man. And he wanted to share the creation that he had brought into being before he created man. He wanted to share that with man. But did man appreciate what God had done for him? No, because from the very beginning, man, just, they just did not listen to God. They disobeyed him. And that's sad when you think about it. It's really sad. 1 Samuel 13, 14, it says, But now your kingdom shall now continue. 
The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. It's interesting that in Saul's case, after Samuel tells him exactly what has happened and what's now going to happen to him, and that the kingdom is going to be taken away from him, he begs Saul to forgive. I mean, he begs Samuel to forgive him. He shouldn't be asking Samuel for forgiveness. He should be asking God for forgiveness. Samuel is a prophet for God. He's a priest of God. But they should, he should not be asking him for forgiveness. It's not his place to give forgiveness. But he asks him, he says, Pardon my sin and return with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel gave him the answer, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord. So here is a man who has rejected God, essentially. Wanting a man of God, wanting a prophet of the Lord to come with him pardon his sin, and worship with him. And Samuel did exactly what he was supposed to do. He says, no. No. That's it. So he turns to walk away from that. Saul reaches out the gra and grabs the edge of his robe and it rips. Samuel immediately interprets that as a sign from God. And he tells him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and given it to your neighbor. It's going to be from that point on the Spirit of the Lord is also taken away from Saul. And it's replaced with a spirit that's going to bedevil him if you want to really come down to it. It's going to really get into him and make him just jealous and worried about every little thing that's going to happen. And then he finally comes to understand that it's David who is the one that's going to take his place. David, who he wanted to be in his court, to play his harp and soothe this evil spirit that he had upon him. Can't do that when God decided was, he was the one that was going to punish him because of what he had done. That's the sad thing about it. Saul was a leader that the people had chosen, not God. We always have to keep that in mind. It would be David that would be the king that God chose and was very specific about it. Revelation 21, 12 through 14. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. At the gates were 12 angels and inscribed on the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates to the east, three gates to the north, three gates to the south, and three gates to the west. The wall of the city was built on twelve foundation stones, and on these were the twelve names of the twelve emissaries of the Lamb. So the New Jerusalem is going to have twelve gates with the name of the twelve tribes of Israel on them. We would have to assume that Joseph would be the name of one of these tribes because Joseph is restored as a tribe in the book of Revelation. What's missing in the book of Revelation is Ephraim. Why Ephraim? Ephraim is absorbed into Joseph. Ephraim was also the tribe that took leadership over the ten tribes that left and went to the north and immediately went into idolatry. That was after the man that God had chosen to lead them he had, God was willing to make a covenant with him and told him that he would establish his throne forever if he followed the Torah and he did what God obeyed him to do. But what did he do? He set up two golden calves for worship. He made a priesthood not from the Levites, from, from all the tribes of Israel. And he made his own festival days and not the festival days that God had chosen for the people of Israel. How stupid can you be? Think about it. These people are doing everything that God has instructed them not to do. They have not learned a thing. But we do the same thing today. Do we really think that we're so far removed from them just because we are more technologically advanced or whatever from that? 
You know, sometimes they tell you that the more, the smarter you get, the dumber you are. Perfect example of that is Solomon. Who was the wisest man that was ever known? Solomon. Who asked for the gift of wisdom from God? Solomon. Who did God commend for asking for that gift? Solomon. What did Solomon do with that gift? He disobeyed God. He built high places for his wives. He had so many wives, I don't know where the guy had time. I really don't. 300 wives and 600 concubines. Give me a break. Yeah? Okay. The reality is, is we don't know how many of them he had married simply to make a peace treaty with that country that they came from. Because that's basically what he did. He married to make peace. But those wives infected him and turned his heart away from God. And the same thing happens to us today because we make our own gods. We place up their people that we're not supposed to be doing these things for. We are supposed to look past people and look to God. God's the one who's going to take care of us. God's the one who's going to provide for us. God's the one who's in charge. In Acts 9, 10 through 16, it says, There was a Talmud in Damascus, Hananiah by name, and in a vision the Lord said to him, Hananiah, he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to Straight Street, to Yehuda's house, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Shaul. For he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Hananiah coming in and placing his hands on him to restore his sight. But Hananiah answered, Lord, many have told me about this man, how much harm he has done to your people in Yerushalayim. And here he has a warrant from the head Kohanim, the head priest, to arrest everyone who calls on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, because this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name to the Goyim, to the nations, even to their kings and to the sons of Israel as well. For I myself will show him how much he will have to suffer on account of my name. Shaul, of course, is the Apostle Paul. That's how we know him. Where did Paul change his name? There really is no biblical record in there of him changing his name. I've heard many different reasons why. Did it some say that that was his Roman name because he was a Roman citizen? So that means he had at least one Roman parent. So if he was a Roman citizen, somebody said that that was also his alternate name. And Shaul, of course, was his Hebrew name. I don't know if it was or not. We're not told anything about that in Scripture. But it had, takes on the tenor as it changes. The book of Acts is usually attributed to Luke. And Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. And Luke wrote his gospel, the Gospel of Luke, and he's the accepted author of the book of Acts. So he wrote these basically in Greek in order to send these to the people so that they would understand who Yeshua was. So he shared it with them because that was his calling was to go to the nations. He continued Saul's mission. He did what Saul had been called to do. But you notice that Saul also was to go to the sons of Israel, not just to the nation. But he would be known as the apostle to the Gentiles. The apostles of the Goyim, because the Goyim, of course, are the nations. But it's interesting how he says, and I, I myself will show him how much he will have to suffer on account of my name. And Paul never begrudged the things that he had to go through and how he had to suffer. He was stoned and left for dead. He was locked up in prison. He was whipped. Ultimately, he would be beheaded. That was a merciful death. That was the death of a Roman citizen. The other apostles wasn't so merciful the way most of them died. So, you know, but he suffered for what he did. I mean, here's a guy who on the one hand was a knowledgeable Jewish rabbi. 
On the other side of it, he funneled that energy that he had for persecuting the followers of Yeshua into lifting Yeshua up to teach anybody that he came across all about him. He would teach anyone. And from the things that we read in Scripture, that guy could talk. He talked so much one evening that the guy fell asleep on the second story of a house and fell out the window and died. And what did Paul do? Did he go down and mourn his death? He went down and he prayed over the man and he was resurrected from the dead and they went back inside and he started teaching all over again. We need more of that. You want to die? <laughs> you need more of that. Yeah, you need more of that. Huh? God gives us everything that we need. It's all there. So it would have been interesting to hear Paul teach. Because a lot of times you need to hear it right from the horse's mouth to understand exactly what's being said besides the things that were written down that a lot of us take and twist and turn and make them into something that he probably never taught to begin with and never meant to begin with. He was a Torah-observing Jew. He was trained as a rabbi. He didn't forsake all of that. He knew that. He even upholds the Torah. We see that. He even upholds the traditions of the Jewish people. He doesn't put any of that down. He upholds the dietary laws. He does all the things that you're supposed to do in there. He just doesn't go that extra step to follow the rabbinical interpretation of it all. He knows that that's incorrect now. He knows that it's wrong. He knows it's not the proper way in order to do it. So he became one of the greatest apostles that there were. But then again, we don't have all the writings of all the other apostles as much as we have the writings of Paul. I'm wondering how many other letters exist out there that were written by the other apostles. Now we have to look at them as being the first apostles because there were other apostles that came after that. But they weren't the same as the original 12. And you have to also remember that the 11 apostles that were left after Judas committed suicide, they, they, rolled, they chose lots and they picked their own replacement. But it's obvious that that was not what the Lord was, had to do. He had a plan for Paul. Paul was to be that other apostle. He was to be that one because he would be able to relate not just to the Jews, but to the nation to the Goyim. He would go into a place, and if he wasn't familiar with how they did it, he would run around, and he looked, and he learned about their culture. He learned about their beliefs. He learned about how they did things and what they believed in. Then he would proceed to go and he would speak. It always tell, it tells us in Scripture that what he did when he first went into a place was is he looked for synagogues. And if there was a synagogue there, he went to the synagogue and he went there on the Sabbath day and he stood up in there and he began to share about Yeshua in the synagogue. If they listened to him and they invited him back, he came back the following Shabbat and he taught some more. If they didn't listen to him and kicked him out, then he went and he took it to the nation. He went to them next. He wasn't going to lose any opportunities to share about Messiah no matter what. He knew what his calling was. And he would honor that calling until the day that he died. The other apostles were still a little bit on a bumpy road as they were going along until the Holy Spirit. And when they received the Ruach HaKodesh, they changed. And they became men on fire for God. They wanted to share with them. And you can have to look at these people and you see them and how they changed the face of their world. And the changing of the face of their world has changed the face of our world. But you know something? We need them today. We need them again to go out there and to do that. Today, if Yeshua returned, I wonder how many people would really believe that it was Yeshua. Of course, the way he's going to return is not the first time that he came. 
Second time that he's coming, he's going to be coming the way that he left. So that means he's coming back in the clouds. And he's going to come back in a way that people are all going to be able to see him. And they will see this alien being floating down from the sky, coming down here to the earth. But guess what's following him? I think that ought to scare everybody up in there. You see all these movies that are out there with all this stuff and all that, you know, we're coming down, well, here's science fiction come to life in a way that people are not going to believe it. They'll probably be dumbfounded and stand there until they realize as he gets closer who it is. Because I don't believe you're going to be able to miss understanding and recognizing who Yeshua is. He's going to come back as king. He's not going to come back as the suffering servant. He's already done that. He's going to come back as the king this time. The set of his kingdom here on the earth and no one will be able to stand against him. I'm looking forward to that day and I wish that day was now. I don't know how long it's going to be. I've talked to other people in other places and different things, and they've told me that they all have an expectation that something's going to happen. Well, I've heard that for a long, long time, that there's an expectation that something's going to happen. But things are moving. Things are changing. We don't know when it's going to happen. It would be great if it would happen in our lifetime. It would be great if we could see him. We don't know what's going to happen because there are other things that have to precede his coming. One of the major things that have to precede his coming is the coming of the anti-Messiah, of the false prophet, and the beast, and all of these things have to come. This has to happen. Third temple has to be built. Third temple has to be desecrated by the anti-Messiah. So many things have to happen before that. And then the nations have to turn against Jerusalem in mass, against Israel, and attack them. And basically almost come to the point where they take Jerusalem and destroy the Jewish people. That is the final act that will usher in the return of Messiah because he will not allow Jerusalem or his people to fall. He put them back in the land for a reason. They are holding that land. And they're only holding a portion of it. In Revelation 3, 15 and through 17, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So if you think because you've got a lot of money that you're rich and everything is going to be wonderful for you, God looks at you as being the opposite of that. He looks at what you're doing with what he's blessed you with, because everything that you have comes from God. Can Satan bless? Yes, Satan can bless. But Satan needs God's permission to do anything that he needs to do against his people. We know that. The story of Job tells us that. It teaches us that. That Satan needs God's permission. So if, but he also tells us that he will test his children. And we will be tested. Why will we be tested? To make sure that we are holding on to our faith. That we are walking in his way. We are doing what he wants us to do. God expects a different lifestyle from his children. And if that lifestyle goes against the world and the way that the world is living, then so be it. That's the way it's going to have to be because if the ways of the world are not lining up with the ways of God, something's got to give. And do you really think that if you follow the ways of the world and you're not following God's ways, when the day of judgment comes and you stand before him to be judged, that he's going to listen? Well, I followed the ways of the world because that was the ways that it was and we're supposed to do that. Because that's what it says in there, that we were told that whoever we're under, we're supposed to follow their rules, their laws. If it causes you to go against God, 
How can you follow man's laws? Aren't God's laws first? Because if you don't follow God's laws first, you're going to come in second. And if you come in second, there's nothing below that, people. It's either first place or second place. First place gets you the gold ring. Second place gets you a really hot place. So, think about that. Well, the lake of fire is called a lake of fire because it's cold. And I'm going to close with this. Tower Man says, Have a purpose in life, and having it, throw into your work such strength of mind and muscle as God has given you.